This is an incident I remember from the days when I was a cop in the local district. I have told and recalled this many times to my friends and family, for they find it amusing that this even occurred. They were disappointed that I left my cause to this fable of a story. My own family refused to believe me, but it became the occasional spooky story to my friends and family at reunions or camping days. But that's what they say, because they don't really know the shock of what happened to me that night. They don't know the reason why that incident will remain engraved in my brain for the rest of my life. There is one thing that I didn't tell them, and I shouldn't if I wanted to remain sane and have a decent life. I needed to forget about that detail, so I started to recall my story to my family while leaving the detail out, hoping my brain would overwrite the details if I recalled it over and over again. But it didn't. This happened in the summer of 2009. I was an officer for two years then, and I was doing pretty good at my job. Life was going great, and my girlfriend had proposed to me on the same day that I was going to. It was phenomenal, to say the least. But then, all that unfolded on that night would haunt me forever. It was May 2009, and me and my new partner, who I will address as Bob, were patrolling the Redwood Street when we heard from dispatch that there was a domestic violence distress from the nearby area that we were in. It was a chance to show the rookie how the pros did it, so I took it up and decided to check it out. As we drove to the house, I could see the houses on the street were quiet, almost abandoned. It looked like nobody lived in this area, but I didn't pay much attention to it. I parked the car in the front of the destination, the house where we had gotten the call from. It looked to be a very simple house with two floors. I opened the door and walked out of the car as Bob followed behind me. I walked up the steps to the porch and instantly saw that the door was a bit open. I took my gun out and signaled Bob to arm himself. I decided that it would have been a bad idea to enter from the front, so I went out the back to see the back door was open too. I and Rookie followed inside quietly. And all of a sudden, Bob yelled to check if there was someone inside. The Rookie move, I know. I smacked him in the head when he did that, but it seemed like we were all alone in the house. The hall was simple. A carpet laid in the center and a few sofas surrounding it. There wasn't much detail to the entire hall other than it was totally generic. I decided to go up the stairs and Bob followed, armed. As I reached the end, I saw three rooms in the little hallway, all open. We went inside. The room was fairly lit, notes scribbled all over the wall, with ideas for stories and a manuscript on the table. I assumed that this house, or rather this room, was home to a budding writer, and it seemed like it. Bob looked around the room as I picked up the manuscript and started to read it. It was about a lady from the Victorian times who was killed brutally. I mean, that's what the manuscript said. While I read the short manuscript, Bob had wandered off to the second room, the one adjacent to the one I was in. He opened it up and then called me. I kept the manuscript down and went to him. My eyes fell on the room as I was weirded out. The room looked to be from the Victorian era. Maybe the writer was creating a role play for that story. I didn't know. I went inside anyway, and it was convincing. The props, if they were, but it almost looked like the furniture was really from the Victorian times, preserved maybe. Nonetheless, I went out of the room to check the last room that was closed. I opened it up as Bob took his gun out, preparing for the worst. We couldn't take any risk, after all. We were in an unknown house. The door opened, and we could only see darkness. The room was broken. The darkness engulfed it. There were no lights in the bulb sockets. It seemed like there was no power either in the room. It was just utterly broken. Maybe it was being remade. Bob and I checked out the room and found nothing odd. Just a couple of paint buckets and brushes. Nothing out of the ordinary. We closed the door behind us as we went out of the room. I went into the first room only to see that something had changed. There was a Polaroid camera on the bed. Was this camera here before Bob? I said, as I looked back at Bob, as I might have missed a detail or two in the room. But he shook his head in a not knowing manner. I looked at the Polaroid and, as I picked it up, it started to work. 
the noise of a picture printing out. As it soon did, the picture fell on the bed as I didn't grab it in time. Bob picked it up, and as he looked at it, the horror on his face was visible. He was terrified. I asked him why he seemed to be so scared. He gave the picture to me, and as I looked upon it, I too froze in fear. It was a picture of us getting out from the cruiser. Taken from the window of this room, I was terrified. How could this happen? There was no one in the house to take this picture of us arriving. Nonetheless, in the time I thought about it, the camera printed another picture. This time, it was of me and Bob in the Victorian-styled room, but it was angled from the wall. You could see the spiral stairs behind and the hallway, but that's not what froze me in fear. When I looked at the corner of the picture, I could see a shadow crouched down in the corner of the small hallway behind the door, peeking at us. It was getting harder to breathe, and I showed Bob the picture. He was in another expression. Terrified was an understatement. The camera printed out another picture in the meantime. This time, it was of us being in the dark room. I could see us both exploring the room in the dark as there was a figure in the corner. It was a woman, dressed in Victorian-era clothes. I froze. As I looked at her expression, the inhumane grin spread right through her cheeks. It was animalistic, but how didn't we notice it? The camera printed another picture. This time it was the third room's door opening and the hag of a lady walking out. As the camera finished printing this, we heard the door open and made the run. We didn't look back. We just ran with all the power we had. I opened the car's door and sat in as Bob closed his door. I started the car and threw the camera in the back as he sped out of the block. Apparently it was around 11 when we had reached the quarters and Bob was trying to gain his composure back. What we saw in that house was not of this world. That lady and the inhumane grin on her face gave me chills as I thought about it. But we left the pictures behind, so we had no proof about that. Only the camera that I kept on my desk. Bob left the quarters as he got his stuff to go back to his house. He was scared, and I was too. But as I got ready to leave, the camera curled a bit, as it printed the last picture it would ever print. And that's the thing I don't tell anyone. That detail that I kept hidden from everyone about this incident is the last picture printed showed me and Bob in the car as we sped away from the house and the same lady in the back seat grinning inhumanely as you looked ahead. Nine one one. what is your emergency? There is someone on my porch. I don't know him and he won't go away. All right. Please tell me your current address. 12 Twin Bluff Road. I'm sending the police now, but I want you to stay with me. Tell me what this man is doing. I'm... I'm trying to remain calm. All right. My house sort of juts out on one side, so I am walking to a window in that jut where I can see the front door. So are you the only one there? Just me and the man. So what is happening? Nothing as of yet. Oh God. What? The man is sitting there on a chair. He is just smiling at me. Oh, God. Oh, God. The police are on the way. Good. He is just sitting there. He is not moving. Why is he smiling at me? What is happening? I don't know. You know what? Move away from the window. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Why? What if he tries breaking into my house? I'd rather see him. It is your safety versus your house. I'm going to try to help you. Okay. I'm walking deeper in my house. I want you to affirm you are the only one there. Oftentimes, criminals don't work alone. I don't hear anything. I'm alone in the bathroom, but I can only think about that man. Now that I think about it, something was wrong about that man. I need to see him again to tell you what exactly. The squad car is only five minutes away. Good. Good. I'm going to see the porch again. Are you sure you will be safe? Yes. Report what is happening, second by second. I will. He's still there. Oh God, not again. His pupils, that's what's wrong. His smile, he's gotta stop. I swear he hasn't moved since I left. 
Only his eyes seemed to follow me. You said something was wrong with his pupils. Oh yes, they take up his whole eyes. Almost like dog eyes. Wait, he just cocked his head. His face lost its smile. Oh no, it's back again. Three minutes and the police will arrive. He just got up. He mouthed something. Should I sit down or stand? Do you want me to come in? No, 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 oh good. He sat back down. What is happening? Nothing. He is smiling at me, not moving. Oh no, I hear creaking in my house. Quickly now, get to a bathroom. Lock yourself in it. I'm pretty much sprinting there. The creaking has stopped. Doesn't matter. Lock yourself in the bathroom. I wasn't ever thinking of not doing it. I'm locked in. I'm safe. The phone falls silent. Nothing is heard. Hello? You still there? Sir? Hello? The cutting edge of silence. The edge of something which is so calm. The bloodied blade. Sir, are you there? The call ends. Police cars arrive the next day. There is an investigation that same day. A police report says, after investigation, we found out that the man in question was lured into the bathroom where the murderer was waiting <laughs> silently behind the shower curtains. She ran. The 911 operator was found to be working with the criminals. The audio recordings show that she claims to have sent a police car. We urge citizens to call 911 in the event of any emergency. The events that took place that night were an isolated incident. But nevertheless, we are running full investigations in the agency. <laughs> he ran. He was never caught. He died that faithful day. Silence lived on. I'm really at the end of my rope here. No, check that. I was at the end of my rope weeks ago. Now I'm sort of clinging to the side of the cliff by one bloody fingernail. I didn't even know that you could get banned from calling 911. 31 calls over 36 nights later, and I know the truth. They told me that unless they find an actual emergency situation the next time they respond, they'll arrest me on the spot and haul me off to jail. And you know what? Honestly, that doesn't sound like a bad idea right now, except for the part where I'd probably lose my children. Like I said, this started 36 nights ago. My ex-husband had the kids for the weekend and I was looking forward to just relaxing by myself with some red wine and something dumb on Netflix. I was in the kitchen pouring out my wine when I looked out the window and I thought I saw something there in my yard. A person. It was dark out so I rushed over to the light switch and flipped it up. The outside light turned on and flooded the yard. Nothing there. I shrugged it off and sat down on my couch, scrolling through my Netflix options. Then. The front door started rattling. That got my attention. After a while, the rattling stopped, but I sat there frozen for several minutes. Then the doorbell rang. The sound, like a dagger into the silence. I spilled some wine. It's probably Alan. Probably just forgot something for the kids and forgot that I changed the lock. I sighed and got up to check the door through the peephole. Somebody was there alright, but it wasn't Alan. At least, I didn't think so. It was a man, dressed all in black, including a black ski mask. As I was watching him, he reached down and grabbed the doorknob and started rattling the door again. That was when I made my first 911 call. I have seen that man every night since. The only reason I've made 31 911 calls instead of 36 is that for four of those nights, the cops were parked right outside of where I was staying. When I saw him, I only needed to flick the lights four times and that would signal the cops. And while I saw that man for 36 nights in a row, the cops saw him zero times. Not after I installed a camera pointing at my backyard. Not after I installed cameras all around the house. Not after I installed the cameras inside the house. They never saw him, but I did. Every night, sometimes hiding in the shadows, sometimes standing inches away from me, breathing heavily. I will tell you about one night so you can understand how terrified I am. This was definitely the worst night in isolation, but the longer this goes on, the more every night becomes worse than the last. This was a bit over a week ago, maybe 10 days. I started off feeling some guarded relief. 
The cameras were all installed around the house, and the cops were parked outside. If and when this creep showed up, they'd get him. Or if not, then at least the cameras would prove that he existed, and maybe offer up some clues to his identity. I put the kids to bed and let myself have a bit of wine, to help relieve that lingering terror. By the time I was ready for bed, I felt fairly relaxed and confident that I was safe for the first time since this thing started. I was ready for a good night's sleep, and I passed out pretty much as soon as I settled into bed. Sometime in the night, I was awakened by the creak of the floorboards by the foot of my bed. For half a second, I was confused with the half-hangover haze. Then I understood. Somebody was in the room with me. I had a gun in the room, but I kept it in a lockbox at the top of my closet where the kids couldn't reach it. It was useless to me just then. How the hell did he get past the cops, I wondered, as another foot landed on the floor with a soft thud. Mommy? My heart almost exploded with relief. It was my four-year-old kid, Alex. Come on, I said, sitting up and patting the bed. On most nights, he still ended up in there with me. Mommy? There's a man in my room and he wants to see you. I bolted out of my bed. Stay here, I said, running to the closet for the gun. He's nice, said Alex. He gave us candy. Oh God, Shane is still in there. My hand gripped the gun in the box, wavering. Did I want to bring a loaded gun into a room with my six-year-old kid? I didn't know the answer, but I pulled the gun out anyway and ran down the hall after closing Alex in my room. When I got there... There was a man sitting on the bed with Shane. Shane was eating a candy bar, smiling. Mom, he said. Mr. Knight is awesome. How come you never told us about him? The man was holding a knife up behind Shane's back. I kept the gun behind my own back. What do you want? I asked. Then I heard the man speak for the first time. He kept changing his voice modulating it in an agitated way so that it was really high-pitched and then really low, now fast and smooth, now slow and stuttering. I want what any man wants, he said. I want your devotion and your gun. Hand it over or you know the boy goes night, night for a long, long time. The hand Holding the gun was slick with sweat, and my stomach was in knots as my heart pounded away in primal terror. You have a gun, Mom? asked Shane. And if I do give it to you, then what? I asked the man. Then I'll leave for now. No sense causing a ruckus with those officers down there if I don't have to. He lifted the knife an inch higher. And no sense you causing a ruckus either, is there? I handed him the gun. Good call, he said. He lowered the knife, then turned to Shane. Hey, bud, Mr. Knight has to get going now. Lots of other kids to give candy to. You be a good boy and we'll meet again soon. Yeah? I'll be good, said Shane. The man stood up and walked to the open window. I know that I locked that. He stepped out into the garage roof as I grabbed Shane and yanked him back into my room. I flicked my lights on and off four times. By the time the cops got inside and upstairs, the man was gone. That was the last night I spent with my kids. I see them during the day, but never at night. The man does not seem interested in them, only in me. I can't, for the life of me, think of who this man might be. Somebody I know? I'll admit, I did turn my thoughts towards Alan, my ex-husband. We had had some nasty fights before and after the divorce. But would he really hold a knife above his own child's back? I didn't think so, but I tested it one night. The kids stayed with my mother, and Alan stayed with me in the kids' room. I knew it wasn't him because at 1 a.m. I woke up to the man throwing acorns at my window. He was there in the driveway, somehow always just out of the camera's view. Alan was snoring away in Shane's bed. I've racked my brain trying to think of who it could be. It just doesn't make sense. None of it does. 
It's just a nightmare without reason. How is he there every night and always gone without a trace by the time the cops get there? How is it possible? It doesn't matter where I am. At my house, at my mother's house, at this hotel. He always finds me. He always lets me see him. And he always disappears back into the night. Sometimes, I wonder if I really am imagining it. Shane and Alex both say they remember Mr. Knight. But maybe I put that thought in their head. That's what the cops think. That's why they've issued a written warning to me about calling 911 again. And it's what Alan thinks. He's started to talk about taking full custody. At least until I get better. Sometimes the man leaves me notes. But they are always printed out and the cops think that I'm the one who prints them out. They even found a word doc on my computer with one of the notes. And now, now I'm holding the latest note which he slipped under my hotel door as I was writing this. It says, tonight's the night. I don't know what to do. If I call the cops and he's not here, I get arrested and probably lose custody of my kids. And if I don't call the cops and he is going to do something tonight, he's here. <laughs> Last night, at around 2.30 a.m., I was woken up by a phone call. I assumed it was spam, maybe my ex-girlfriend calling me to say something stupid and instinctively reached over to decline the call. My tired brain didn't even bother seeing who it was as I hung it up and went back to sleep. I got another call around five minutes later. I groaned and reached to decline it again, but this time I saw who was calling me. 911? Why was 911 calling me? I checked the time. It was 2.35. A call from the police at 2.35? Confused, I answered the call. Hello? I asked. I didn't hear anything at first. Hello? I asked again. Hi, a raspy voice replied. This would have been the part where I threw my phone across the bed, but for whatever reason I decided to keep talking. Who is this? I said, forgetting for a second that it was obvious. Didn't the number appear when I called? It's the police, you fucking idiot. I remembered trying to decline the call around this point, but the button didn't work. What the hell? I muttered to myself, hearing the person on the other end laugh to himself. Idiot. You're an idiot, the voice quietly said. Irritated, I asked. You don't sound like an operator. Oh, I'm an operator, all right, the voice dryly hissed but not one that's willing to kiss your ass anymore. This was confusing. What are you talking about? I said, trying to hang up the call again, but it wouldn't even let me power off my phone anymore. I was being forced to listening to some croaky voice spout a bunch of nonsense. The voice seemed to ignore my previous question and kept talking. I am an operator and I can do everything an operator can do. And more. The voice chuckled to himself again before he kept going. I'm sorry for messing up your good night's sleep. But you need to know about something. What the fuck? I realized that whoever I was talking to, probably part of the police, and stopped myself at the last second. What should I know about you? There was another pause before the operator began talking again. Before I ask anything, do you remember everyone who called you today? Besides you, nobody called me today. Why do you ask? The operator breathed what sounded like a sigh of relief, but his voice made it hard to hear exactly what it was. Good. That means our plan is still working. You're not the only one who picked up so far, the operator said. Plus, the simple fact that you picked up pretty much forces you to go through with what we have planned. I managed to ask, what do you mean? Before I was interrupted by multiple notifications. I had received four or so text messages, all from different numbers. I opened up one of the messages without thinking. It was a house. The image looked like it was taken in the middle of the night. The sky was dark and none of the windows in the house had any light in them. It didn't look like any of the houses in my neighborhood, not even any houses I recognized from anywhere nearby. I opened up the other three texts. They all showed a similar image, an image of someone's house taken in the middle of the night. 
What is this? I asked. I already said. You aren't the first one who received a call like this. These are all from the past four months, the operator replied. His gravelly voice seemed ominously quieter than before. You're looking at dead people's houses. I stayed quiet for a bit before replying, What? You're looking at dead people's houses. All of these people lost the game, so we killed them. You're not serious, are you? The operator laughed again. <laughs> I hated his laugh. His scratchy, mocking laugh so much. You idiot. Of course we're serious. Do you want to see the bodies? No. No, I don't, I replied. Coward. Fine, you don't doubt that I'm a 911 operator, right? What kind of operator talks about killing people in some game? You're not an operator. You're a maniac. I found myself shouting suddenly. What the fuck do you want from me? Why did you call me? Ugh, fine. I confess. I may or may not be a 911 operator. There. Are you happy now? Please, leave me alone. Hang up the phone. Don't call back. I'll call the police on you, even if you're already an operator. The operator started <laughs> cackling, and he kept cackling for way, way too long. Oh, you idiot. You blind idiot. What police? And that's when he hung up. I struggled to fall back asleep for a bit, especially when I got another text message from one of the phone numbers that was basically recording of the whole conversation. The message claimed that he said something that gave it away, but after listening to it quite a few times, I still can't find what he's talking about. But I'm scared. From what I've heard, 911 operators can track calls. It's kind of a running joke in my office that I always get the weirdest calls. And it's true. One of the more interesting ones I got was from a drunk guy who meant to call the cops and was trying to file a noise complaint about his own party. While some of my calls can be pretty strange, they're usually pretty tame. I've been pretty lucky because I haven't had too many disturbing or sad stories to tell from my years of working as a 911 operator. If you're looking for something like that, I can point you to several of my colleagues because unfortunately, there's no shortage of those in this industry. The call that particularly sticks in my mind is one that I took about a year or two ago. I can honestly say that it's one of the most frightening experiences of my entire life and think it's going to stick with me forever. It had actually been a fairly slow afternoon that day. I know it sounds kind of insensitive, but if you're not taking a call, the job can get pretty boring. I got stuck covering my friend's evening shift and I didn't expect things to get more interesting. I was counting down the minutes until my shift ended when a call came through my line. I put the headset on and ran through the usual script. 911, what's your emergency? I asked. I think there's someone in my house. The voice sounded like it belonged to a young child. My heart sank. Calls from children were always the worst. We're trained to get as much information from each caller as possible. This makes it easier to more fully understand the situation as well as figure out which emergency services we need to dispatch. What's your name, sweetie? I kept my voice calm and upbeat. There was no need in scaring them any further than they undoubtedly already were. Elizabeth, she said softly. I think she might have been crying. That's a beautiful name. Mine's Amelia, even though I didn't show it. I was beginning to get nervous. This is very important. Can you tell me what's happening right now? The line was quiet for a moment, but then Elizabeth started talking. I think someone's in my house. Where are your parents? I asked. They're not home. I'm not sure where they are. I was pretty angry when I heard this. What kind of parents leave a little girl home alone this late at night? Is there anyone else there with you? Yeah, I think they're looking for me, Elizabeth began, but her voice abruptly stopped at the very end of her sentence. Had it not been for her quiet, frightened breaths, I would have thought she or whoever else was there hung up. They said my name. She was definitely crying now. Where are you right now? I heard a door close. In my parents' closet. She spoke a little louder now, probably thinking that the intruder wouldn't be able to hear her from in there. I hope she was right. I was glad she knew to hide. 
A lot of kids freeze up in dangerous situations like this, especially if their parents or an older sibling aren't there. I asked for her address, which she gave me, but for the sake of privacy, I will only say that Elizabeth's house was in a fairly nice neighborhood in my area, and it wasn't far from the police station, which was very helpful. Elizabeth, just focus on my voice. I need you to try and relax. I'm sending the police to your house right now, and they should be there in about five minutes. Can you hold on until then? Even though I would usually try to get a little more information about the intruder, I always tend to err on the side of caution when children call 911. I'd much rather send someone and have it be a false alarm than risk their safety. Elizabeth did not answer my question, and it took her longer than I was comfortable with to respond. When she did, it was only one word. Listen. I heard the phone crackle as she brought it away from her ear and held it out in front of her. At first, I didn't hear anything. But as I focused on the background noise, I noticed a lot of whispering. I couldn't tell what they were saying, but it definitely sounded like it was coming from more than one person. I hoped the police would get there on time. As much as I help people with my job and as many lives as I've saved, it's always so frustrating that I can't do anything myself other than wait and talk. Elizabeth's voice came out in hushed sobs. He's coming up here. Please help. The police are almost there. I need you to be quiet so he doesn't hear you. You're going to be okay, sweetie. I promise. She seemed to calm down a bit. Everything was quiet for a moment save for the whispering, which was much louder now. I still didn't know what they were saying, but I was sure it was coming from multiple people. I could pick out at least three distinct voices. When I heard a door creak open through the phone, my heart leapt. Elizabeth screamed and I knew that the intruders had found her. I was so scared for her and I desperately hoped that someone would be able to help her soon. Are you okay? I need you to tell me what's going on. I was trying and failing to stop my voice from cracking. I couldn't let her know that I was afraid. There's a man, Elizabeth whispered. He has really long legs and a really big smile. <laughs> my imagination was running away from me. I pictured this poor girl alone in the closet as an impossibly tall man towered over her. I heard another bang coming from somewhere in the house and someone yelling, police, thank God. I could hear Elizabeth crying as the whispers intensified. I still didn't understand how she only saw one person. There had to have been more than four. He isn't touching the floor. The line cut off. I frantically tried to reestablish the connection, but no matter how many times I tried, I was met with only silence on the other end. I would like to close with a message to any parents reading this. Please, please don't leave your young children home by themselves. I haven't heard anything about Elizabeth or her family in the years since this happened. The police only found the phone. <laughs>